Joining me now on the panel is Liberal MP Sarah Henderson from Karangamite, which is just outside of Geelong. Labor backbencher Michael Danby, who's the member for Melbourne Ports, which is inner city Melbourne. And Liberal Senator for Victoria, which is everywhere, James Patterson. Welcome, everyone. Evening. Now, I'm just going to start talking very loosely about coal. We've obviously had uh, a debate today about whether or not Liddell could be picked up by another player. Alint is in the market, Delta is in the market. Liddell, of course, is the very big power station in New South Wales, slated to close in 2022. Um, you're all Victorians, you're all in the federal parliament, but you're all Victorians. So you'll know that in the last 12 months, Victoria's wholesale electricity spot price has increased by 85%. Uh, Victoria has gone from being a net exporter of energy to a net importer of energy. Uh, there is a debate by uh, colleagues inside the Liberal Party and uh, the National Party about having a conversation or a, an internal debate about the future of coal. One component of that is to restart uh, the Brownfields site of Hazelwood, which was uh, closed down now almost 12 months ago. Um, Sarah Henderson, first to you. Um, putting aside coal for a moment, but clearly um, I've still got friends and family in and around Geelong. Uh, power prices are really hurting and they're making a real impact on small business, particularly in Geelong, which is only just getting on its feet after changes in the industrial uh, employment mix. Uh, Peter, good evening. And there's no doubt that uh, we are seeing a resurgence in the Geelong economy. The Karangamite unemployment rate is 3.4 per cent. Wow. So we're actually starting to go gangbusters here with lots happening, a much more diversified economy, but a really a strong investment still in manufacturing and agriculture, which of course are, are very much traditional industries. But there is no, no doubt, Peter, that uh, the cost of energy is uh, a critical issue. But really, the biggest problem in terms of driving up the wholesale power price in Victoria is the forced closure by Daniel Andrews of the Hazelwood power station. That took 22 per cent of our power out of the Victorian market and has had the biggest impact on power prices. And that's why the government is so concerned about the closure of Liddell. Uh, we obviously want to see that uh, power station continue because that uh, contributes some 10 per cent of power to New South Wales. Uh, we've actually announced, as the, uh, the chair of the House Economics Committee, we've announced uh, an inquiry into impediments to uh, business investment. And we've identified, this is a reference from the Treasurer, we have identified energy as one of the major impediments and what can be done about it from a policy perspective. Uh, and I think the states have got a lot to answer for in terms of their renewable energy targets and some of their other policies. James Patterson, um, I, I take Sarah's point. I mean, a reference to look at business impediments will uh, tell, I think, everybody what's bleedingly obvious, but it might give the uh, policymakers some mechanisms to redress some of the damage that's being done about our uh, increases in power prices. But surely it's the fault of both sides of politics for you know, 10 years plus of policies that had a transition to renewables much faster uh, than science can deliver and the weather can deliver because the variability, the non-dispatchable variability of solar and wind is one of the big issues inside the, the market. I agree with you, Peter. I think it's fair to summarise it as a decade of energy policy failure where far too great emphasis was placed on emissions reduction and environmental objectives and, f and nowhere near enough emphasis was placed on reliability and affordability and that is, is kind of the fault of, I would say, um, parties on both sides but overwhelmingly the share of blame falls at the Labor Party. Uh, and I'm pleased that's why we're moving away from this uh, approach of mandates and targets and subsidies uh, and into a, a program that will gradually transition away from those with the, which is the National Energy Guarantee, um, that is the best path forward that is going to reduce these government interventions that have caused so much trouble and so many problems over the last few years. Michael Danby, I mean, if you look at news poll, it's, it's highly likely that, you know, you'll be on the government benches um, in 12 months' time. Uh, I know Sarah and uh, James will work hard to keep you out of office, but, uh, you know, when it looks like there's a win, I guess more policy um, impetus and more attention goes on, on to Labor, on, on to the opposition. We talk about bipartisanship in so many areas. I've seen it work very closely on Indigenous issues and I've seen it firsthand on big national security issues when I worked for the Prime Minister. 
why can't we have some level of bipartisanship in relation to energy that isn't where Labor is always drifted hard to, which is emissions reduction and less about reliability and, renewal and, and, um, and price. Can we get all three to work in some sort of concert so that you know, we're not turning policy making on its head every time the government changes? You'd hope that um, that would be the case. Um, reliability um, has its place. Affordability has its place. Um, uh, new technologies are eventually going to become cheaper, but I do accept your point that they're uh, not f uh, fixing uh, the, the situation um, produced by coal at the moment. Now, I, I don't know whether either of our two uh, Liberal friends are members of that the Monash group, but I heard you and Sam talking beforehand. Uh, Sarah's wrong. Um, Hazel w went offline because the Labor Party in Victoria um, accepts market forces. I'm surprised that um, a Prime Minister of Australia would um, suggest that perhaps the government could make a, uh, an encouragement to a private company to keep uh, another power station in New South Wales going. This is all becoming very confused, uh, Peter. I, I, I know um, people who support Donald Trump are soft on the Russians now, but I've never heard of conservatives in the, in the uh, uh, Liberal National Party government um, saying there should be state subsidies for, to keep power stations open in New South Wales. We should all, I thought we'd all accepted market economics um, uh, with the caveat of environmental safeguards. Yeah, but hang on, no so, one's uh, saying that there are taxpayer subsidies in New South Wales. It's a, it's a straight out no. purchase of a linter, first point. Second point, you are right, Michael Danby. Um, Hazelwood closed because the French company Angers shut it down. But of course, there was an increase to a coal tax by the Andrews government that had an impact on the viability of that station. I have to say, I have toured Hazelwood, I toured them in opposition, and it was very clear to me then that Angers had a long term plan to shut down Hazelwood. It didn't matter what government was in and how it was going to happen, but I think they were tipped over the edge by that change in the coal tax. But put all of that to one side, I mean, the point is you've got a country now, Australia, where we have not got a pure market. You can all argue for a pure market in energy, but there is not a pure market in energy. There's not one in telcos either. We've got $50 billion of taxpayers' money inside the telecommunications market with a big elephant called NBN. So let's not all pretend to be pure. Uh, at the end of this, though, are Australians who are shutting down their businesses because they cannot afford the increases to power. And that's the real issue where government must intervene. Well, Peter, if I can just say, yeah, go, Michael, is, it, it, Michael is wrong. Um, what happened, Daniel Andrews, as you pointed out, tripled the royalties on coal and that uh, while, you, while it's correct that NGM was initial, it was going to eventually close down Hazelwood, uh, that fast-tracked the closure. And it meant that there wasn't enough time to transition so that there would be a more stable energy supply in Victoria. But um, more, more broadly, what this debate does, of course, is contrast some of the really reckless policies that we are seeing from Labor. A 50% renewable energy target, a 45% decrease in, in emissions, uh, which are bound to, of course, drive up uh, prices dramatically. Mm -hmm. And I think we have had some really good runs on the board, Peter, in terms of what we've done in this space. We've tackled some of the gouging. Some of the energy retailers have been gouging. And if you ring an energy retailer and say, I'm going to leave because I'm sick of paying your power prices, suddenly they will find a 30% discount. That's not good enough, and the Prime Minister has addressed that. He's also addressed the issue with uh, reserving domestic gas, and we've also seen a decrease, a dramatic decrease, in the cost of wholesale gas down to about eight gigajoules. But that's so a market dollars intervention, a gigajoule. Sarah. If, you, if you're talking about not that's wanting right. market yeah. interventions, that's a clear market intervention. Well, and I, and I think the market intervention in that case was uh, very, very important. Uh, so when you have an essential commodity like electricity, like gas, uh, I do think we need a strong regulatory framework because it's intolerable to see some of the gouging and some of the conduct in the market that we have seen. But more broadly... But, but Peter, should, um, Peter, should um, the Prime Minister be on the phone to one private company um, suggesting that they make a bid for a company that he doesn't like? And should um, the Monash... Uh, faction or group or whoever they are be suggesting that um, there be government intervention to s subsidise um, 
uh, what they call uh, new high technology coal plants. Um, well, uh, Michael uh, Jambi, I, I guess the problem is you either have a true free market where everybody is out and regulation is as minimal as you can make it and there are no subsidies anywhere, including $60 billion for renewables that will be paid out by 2030. And everyone on the panel supports that, the renewables being paid $60 billion by 2030. You either have a completely free market or you accept that there is intervention for market failure. And I think one of those issues where there is market failure has got to be coal. But look, We'll leave it there because there are other topics that we want to talk about tonight. Um, today at the National Press Club, we had a very interesting, I could say even entertaining speech from Richard Dean and Tali. Uh, it's clear the recent uh, backward movement of the Green vote in South Australia, and particularly Tasmania, has got him out there really trying hard to keep his job. And he had a couple of policies there that are very left-wing policies. Uh, what worries me is the uh, only time these policies look like they get a leg up, Michael Danby, is when uh, Labor get close to win winning but not there enough at state level and uh, certainly under Julia Gillard in 2010 and they have to take on some of these crazy ideas in order to form government. The two that really struck me was this idea that the RBA should be getting into uh, mortgages and I remember uh, under Joe Hockey we had to recapitalise uh, the RBA with significant billions of dollars out of the Commonwealth purse to give it the strength it needed. Uh, that seems to me to be socialism on steroids, but also this idea that everyone, regardless of their income, not, without a means test, every Australian should get a universal wage, pay to them even if they're working, uh, plus access to healthcare and education and all of these other things. Now, how does that work? Who's going to pay for this universal wage, Michael Danby? Well, look, look um, the, the Greens clearly are playing internal politics so that Dean Natal can uh, get support from the more radical New South Wales branch uh, in order to, uh, to keep his job after uh, their failure in Batman. Mm -hmm. But it's madness, this idea that the Reserve Bank uh, have fixed interest rates of 3% and, and lend out to people uh, directly and that we, uh, we have an underlying non-means-tested uh, wage for every person in Australia. This, this is cloud cuckoo land stuff. And, uh, um, you know, I think the issue of housing affordability is something for our young people and our young families all around Australia. But um, I think a, a more realistic, courageous stance, you may disagree with it, is uh, Shorten's uh, abolishing negative gearing apart from uh, the first home. So, uh, you know, crazy green stuff, uh, reasonable alternative uh, and the government sticking where they are. They're the three alternatives Australians face. All right, we're going to take a break. I'll come back and I'd like to hear both from Sarah and James about this uh, Green Bank and Universal Wage. Stay with us. of a global player, plus the advantage of local know-how, service and support. That all equals SEW Eurodrive. A comprehensive stocked range of mechanical power transmission equipment and motion control electronics used by some of the world's best known brands. SEW has the drive to keep Australia moving into the future. Me? Yeah, mate. Why do whales jump? I don't know. Maybe they want to see what you're up to. But they jump all along the coast. Not just here. Maybe they just want to see if you're visiting cousins in Burley. Well, they might want to know if there are creatures as big as them in the outback. Maybe they're sick of eating plankton. I don't know. Are you having for lunch? No, what? I reckon they jump because they're happy. Happy to come visit us, eh? Queensland, where life's beautiful one day and perfect the next. This is the year to be that business with first of its kind customer Wi-Fi that gives you data and analytics to better know your customers and give them more of what they want. That place that does its thing and knows a thing or two about tech too, using the latest smartphones and business grade broadband to keep demand demanding more. That business that gets online, sells online and finds new customers all the time. You can be that business too with tools and advice from Telstra. 
peckish? Pick up a piece of pure peppered perfection. Three pepper chicken, presented by Subway. Perfectly prepared with peppery golden breadcrumbs. It's a popular pick, so pop in pronto. Three pepper chicken, that's my kind of palate pleaser. Like everyone, I play a lot of different roles in life, and each one has an impact on my skin. So, my skincare needs are always changing, but my brand never does. QV, for every me. This month, take out a new IMAR Tradies insurance policy and get a professional laser rangefinder from Bosch, valued at 139 bucks, absolutely free. Call 13 IMAR or visit IMAR.com.au. Premiere at Home brings more movies straight to the comfort of your couch. And to celebrate, you could win the ultimate home cinema fit out. Exclusive to JB Hi-Fi, buy any stick at Premiere at Home movie and enter for your chance to win. There's the prequel to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Leatherface and Vince Vaughn in Brawl in Cell Block 99, with stacks more in store and online. More movies straight to the comfort of your couch and the chance to win the ultimate home cinema fit out. Only available at JB Hi-Fi. While Jimmy takes pride in helping put a roof over the heads of hundreds of families, he's most proud of the one who's kept over his own. Get paid twice as fast with digital invoicing. Smarter business tools for the world's hardest workers. QuickBooks, backing you. For a free trial, visit our website. Our mantra at Marvel is to grow together. We tend to be building more relationships out of the office as opposed to in. Our growth is probably going to go to the next level with that flexibility. A phone call for us can change everything. And that's why it's important we have a phone system we can rely on. And that's why we're changing everything over to Optus Loop. There's a simple way to help reduce stress. Be more alert. Build a healthier body stronger relationships and most of all just be happy it's walking and everything we need to get started is only two feet away to walk yourself happy go to the heart foundation walking website and access the free app Welcome back. Still with me to answer your questions is Sarah Henderson, Michael Danby and James Patterson. Um, I'm going to go to you first, James, just coming back to this idea of the Greens that everyone should get a universal wage paid for, I don't know by whom, I don't know who the taxpayers mm. left will be, but anyone, everyone should get it regardless of their income and of course this idea that the RBA should be into the home loans market, subsidised home loans market, what do you think of that? Well, what's happening here, Peter, is as the Labor Party moves further to the left on economics, the Greens are getting completely squeezed. And the only thing they can do is move even further to the left on economics. And so they're proposing <coughs> absolutely insane policies here. I mean, the universal basic income has been costed at about $400 billion a year. For your viewers, the federal government spends about $450 billion a year already. So it would be doubling the size of government in Australia. And it would be giving billionaires and millionaires a, a, an income from the government. It's a really toxic, dangerous, bizarre idea. Um, and equally dangerous, I think, is getting the RBA involved directly in lending to consumers. I mean, the RBA has a role of, as a regulator of banks. Mm -hmm. uh, if it would, be, to it also become a competitor to banks, it would have to be regulating itself and its competitors in a really messy, dangerous thing. It's like these people have never heard of the State Bank of Victoria and all the failures of government-owned banks. Well, Sarah Henderson, you know, it was 50-odd years ago that we split away the uh, Reserve Bank from the Commonwealth Bank and now the Greens would have us put them back together again in, in a sense. What do you think of that? Well, it's loony left politics, Peter. As you say, it's uh, socialism on steroids. I think uh, Richard Di Natale is actually really losing the plot to have gone with this uh, policy platform. Even the proposal of a loan to value ratio of 60 per cent meaning that this would only be accessible, these loans, to the most wealthy of Australians. Great for people in Turak, great for people in Double Bay, uh, but most uh, ordinary Australians could not uh, deliver that sort of equity up front when they borrowed money for a home. Mm. So it really is loony stuff. Uh, it doesn't make any economic sense. And it just goes to show, I think, that the Greens are becoming more and more irrelevant as Labor lurches more and more to the left, as James has said. Before we get into some questions from viewers, Michael Danby, I want to just go to you. Um, it's come to my attention that just in and around uh, the, the 
Jewish holiday of Passover, uh, the ABC really disgraced itself. It had a uh, British vicar on for an interview. Uh, this British vicar has been accused of anti-Semitism and of spreading anti-Israel conspiracy theories. Um, he's from cloud cuckoo land. Uh, he has really no place in the mainstream media and yet he was all over the ABC and the ABC doesn't think there's anything wrong with it. The Anglican Church in the United Kingdom is not exactly uh, from watching the Vicar of Dimbley, the hardest line organisation in the world. That, they've, they've dumped him. Uh, they, they don't allow him to broadcast on political matters. Uh, and they've taken away his um, uh, official status. But he gets a 9-11 truther, a person who says that 9-11 was a conspiracy to uh, um, you know, embarrass uh, uh, the, the poor jihadists. Um, he gets a leg up on the, the ABC. I'll tell you what they should have run, Peter. Um, in, in Paris, an 85-year-old survivor of the Holocaust was stabbed to death by a jihadist, and the entire French political elite from both the left and the right were in the streets demonstrating how horrible that is. And in Britain, the Jewish community, which is very, very timorous, um, is demonstrating outside Westminster against Jeremy Corbyn uh, under the slogan enough is enough because he uh, associated himself with a terrible um, uh, image of mm. um, Jewish bankers um, uh, that would have been you know out of something that could have been published in uh, the Sturmer. So you know ABC lift your game come on Australians are more cosmopolitan and responsible on that don't pick obscure Anglican vicars uh, get someone to talk about mainstream issues which are on the front page of the Guardian even and uh, and Le Monde. Well, how about a Jewish scholar to talk about uh, Jewish issues around the Passover? But anyway, let's get on to some of these questions. Uh, question here. This will go to you, I think, uh, James Patterson. It's from uh, a viewer called Neville. He says, why can a cricketer rub sandpaper on a cricket ball and get a penalty of 12 months suspension, loss of income, sponsorship in the order of around $10 million over the period, while a politician cheats at an election and misuses $1.4 million in taxpayer funds, we're talking there obviously of Victoria, and gets no penalty. Well, Neville is absolutely spot on. It's a disgrace that we hold our cricketers to such a high standard and we hold our politicians to such a low standard. There has to be some actual consequences for Daniel Andrews and his Labor Party for systematically rorting taxpayers' money in order to win an election. I mean, in, if we saw that happening in the third world, we'd be issuing alerts about the status of their democracy and um, being troubled about how it's backsliding. We should not tolerate this. And I was really pleased to see, as you say, Peter, Matthew Guy on your program last night saying if he wins the election, that he'll refer this matter to the DPP for investigation because surely, surely laws have been broken here and they must be enforced. Michael Danby, you've got a bit of a record of standing up to thugs inside the Labor Party. Surely you would think that uh, this smells like a rat when money has gone directly into the pocket of the party activists, the campaigners, and they're not there for the use of ministerial or, uh, or backbench staff. And of course, uh, there's no truer evidence of this thing being crook than a government then spending a million dollars all the way to the High Court to keep it out of the public domain. Uh, Peter, I hope I heard you right saying I've got a record of standing up against uh, yes, thugs, standing up in, against uh, thugs in, in any, the, inside the, in the any Labor Party. Of politics. But yes. look, um, the, the, uh, I am against criminalising of our political differences. Um, uh, these things were reported on by Deborah Glass in a very uh, uh, effective way in a system supported by both sides and people pay political consequences uh, for uh, these kinds of uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Now I, I, I'm not uh, um, condemning Daniel Andrews I think in the area of infrastructure and in many others in, it's been a very good uh, uh, a very good government from the point of view of public transport and all of the issues that I care about as well but um, you know uh, the, the voters of Victoria have a choice and that is how uh, our differences should be solved in politics, not by, after the fact, going and um, uh, taking people to court. Um, I, I, I'm against that, Peter. I think criminalising of political differences uh, is but the wrong way to go. Michael, Just as, Michael, theft, yeah. here, theft is criminal, right? If I walked into your office and took $400,000 out of one of your bank accounts, uh, you'd throw me in front of the police and straight away I'd be in front of the courts. Now, why is it any different for a politician, uh, in this case a political party, to take $400,000 away from taxpayers and then spend another million dollars hoping the taxpayers won't find out about it? 
Well, I, I, I'm not going to defend it, Peter. I, I mean, I've always thought um, state politics was the B team. I'm sorry to uh, <laughs> uh, to be to be blunt with you, but um, you've just got um, up to my the, estimation the, the, for saying you will not the, defend it, Michael Danby. <laughs> The, 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 the point is, is that Victorian voters will get a chance to make a decision about this on, um, um, at the election which is due in November. And, and Peter, the, 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 the other thing too is, you know, there's a great film with um, De Niro in it um, called City Heat, where, you, where a city official makes constant decisions and sometimes you don't know where crossing the line crossing the line is. I mean, these people were doing political work. Um, they were... Um, every, every upper house member had a half uh, position and they were amalgamated together to work on marginal seat campaigns. I suspect uh, if they'd actually stayed in their own offices, they wouldn't have been doing all that much different from what they actually did without getting people so upset and um, Deborah Glass so upset. Well, I think I want to run out of time. I'm sorry, Sarah, because I know you... Um you know, if you watch this issue closely, I think Victorians will, if they remember it, certainly have their say at the end of the year. Thank you, my panel, for your well, time absolutely. tonight. Thanks, Sarah Peter. Henderson, James Thanks, Patterson Peter. and Michael Danby. Thanks, Peter. Yes. Thank you.